right, folks, I think we'll we'll kick off because it's it's uh, four o'clock. I can see a few people still joining, but I think we've got all of our all of our speakers and, and so on. So I think we'll kick off by saying uh, good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this. I was going to say first in the nation, which sounds a little bit like the US primaries, but the first of our series of Road to Net Zero events that uh, that we're running at Maritime UK uh, between now and, and next autumn. And uh, clearly, welcome to to the to the southwest. We're doing this in partnership with with Maritime UK Southwest, the the regional trust of organisation for the southwest of England. And the purpose of uh, the this series is to to drill down into the the substance and the tangibles in terms of what's happening on this road to net zero. Clearly, everyone will have seen that there is a huge amount of focus and attention on net zero and on the maritime sector and on the, the combination. And it's, it's really important, I think, that we cut through some of the noise and look at the real substantive work that is ongoing already. Uh, and you'll hear from some fantastic speakers this afternoon on what we uh, on what's already happening in terms of operations and activity and service provision. And then also we'll look at some of the uh, specific flagship projects that we have uh, within the region to help uh, accelerate that trend and accelerate that movement. Uh, and they all have a, uh, a public investment uh, requirement, but they are well in the in the system and in the works to to securing that. So we'll go through those. Um, I think what it's worth saying uh, at the moment is, in, just in terms of who we have on the call, we have as panelists, we have speakers from each of the companies that we've, we've advertised, and we'll go through them in a moment. And we also have, as panelists for the for the webinar, we have uh, members of parliament or members of parliament staff. Uh, either from the region or those MPs with interest in the sector, and particularly some of the, the APPGs that we have in this space. We also have, as panellists, and, and therefore able to interact and talk in the, in the forum type context, we have some peers, uh, local government leaders, uh, LEP executives, and central government civil servants. And the, the thought process there is this is an issue that is right at the top of everybody's agenda. There's an awful lot happening. But we really need to make sure that's all brought together and uh, and clearly from a political context if we're linking together this massive industrial transformation with the environmental imperative and that focus on whether you call it leveling up regional growth uh, on that place-based uh, economics we want to bring all that together and, and we think the maritime sector does that particularly well uh, just in terms of how you can engage clearly if you are a panelist we can see you you can put your hand up you can use the chat function if you are, as a, as a viewer, uh, uh, i.e. we can't see you, but you're here, feel free to use the Q&A function that we have uh, on Zoom, and we will answer those as we go. Uh, we're, we're, we're very fortunate today to have a, a local MP co-chairing the event with us. As, um, as, as you might have heard at the start, uh, Luke Pollard has stepped in to help, uh, uh, has always been interested in the topic and always, always supportive of the sector. But Steve Double was going to be co-chairing the event, but um, due to his other parliamentary responsibilities, has had to had to step back from today. But Luke is, has offered and very kindly is is co-chairing this uh, with us today. And uh, we know um, from, from Luke's work um, in his brief, but also uh, within Plymouth, this is a this is an area that is particularly important to him. And that's why uh, we think it's important to to bring other like-minded MPs along too, so people can understand what the agenda is and what the, the opportunity is. So we're going to hand over to Luke just to say a few words of, of introduction and and then we'll we'll crack on with the event. So over to you, Luke. Thanks so much, Ben. And uh, uh, hello all. I'm your poor pantomime stand-in uh, for Steve Double, who has been uh, called into the chamber for the health secretary's announcement about uh, further restrictions in London and elsewhere. But I am a bit of a fan of the marine and maritime areas, uh, as well as being the Labour and Cooperative Member of Parliament for Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport. I'm also uh, the Shadow Environment Secretary, so I lead on all, uh, all things green for the Labour Party. Um, and I think uh, around decarbonising our marine and maritime uh, areas, we have not only a fantastic story to tell in the West Country, uh, but increasingly, we're also getting more and more platforms to tell it. Now, uh, as a proud Jana myself, there's a lot of really good uh, examples of stuff that's happening in Plymouth uh, uh, that you're going to hear uh, in the next uh, uh, on this webinar. But there is also uh, great examples of uh, expertise happening right across our region. 
as well, which is something that we should be very proud of uh, along the way. Now, there's been a lot of progress made uh, recently around clean maritime, including its inclusion in the Prime Minister's 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution, which is a really positive step in the right direction. Uh, it would be a miss of me as an opposition MP to say it's, a, it's very helpful to have all the things that have been announced already in one handy place, so you can see them again in the in the in the uh, Prime Minister's ten point plan. But we do need to make sure that we're getting uh, uh, the political backing, not just from the government, but on a cross party basis for this. This is clearly an area that will require an element of government support, but it also requires that political will and the political drive to encourage. Uh, and to set the conditions for business and research to thrive in our region. Um, and so really pleased that we've got such good projects uh, for you to hear about today. Uh, but please uh, just echo what Ben said. If you have questions, please do um, uh, put them in. So the more interaction we can have with events like this, the better it is. Um, uh, I'm going to turn back to Ben now for a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we hear from our first, uh, our first speakers. Great, thanks very much, Luke. Wonderful, marvellous. Well, if we can pop onto the next slide, Paul. Great stuff. So uh, just the additional housekeeping, as I say, if you we'll, we'll try and come to uh, politicians first, like we do in sort of APPG context, if we've got questions. But I think we've got enough time and enough opportunities for everybody who wants to ask a question to to, to be able to do so. Um, we, we will be recording uh, the session because we want to, to get it out to as many people as possible. I think if people don't want to be seen, then by all means, turn your camera off um, if you are a panellist. Um, but we will be circulating this to, to other colleagues because we all know, many of us on this call know the strong positive message that, that we have as a sector and, and the sector can, can offer the economy and the country at large. But uh, what we want to do is make sure that this message is, is heard loud and clear across the piece and producing videos and so on is a big part of that. We've also got um, some, some colleagues here um, from Ship uh, Energy, who will be doing a, a write-up of the event. Again, we want to circulate the, the story as much as possible, and we'll, we'll clearly have areas where we can make this a better process for future uh, stops on this road, as it were, on the way to, uh, to next autumn. And uh, your, your suggestions on how we can do that will be gratefully received. Uh, just in terms of the agenda, and then I'll pass on to those who are, who are talking to us, I, I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the recent announcements that there have been and how this positions um, today in, in terms of where we want to get to. And I think the first the first place that we'll we'll start will be Maritime 2050, but then we'll talk about what happened last week and even what's happened today in terms of the, the energy white paper. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to look specifically at a number of projects within the region uh, that are already underway. Either they are viable and optimal solutions or they are projects that have been funded and we're working toward accelerating. Then we're going to look at some really substantive bids that the, the cluster in the Southwest has pulled together and others to, to secure further public funding. And that's really important from a, a political point of view. It's, it's, it gives you some projects to, to get your teeth into and to champion. And we'll be talking about what the, the value and benefits of doing that will be. And then there's a general a question at the end. How do different tiers? We've got, we've got central government here. We've got elected politicians. We've got officials. We've got local government leaders, we've got left executives. What we want to do, and I think we're doing it better than we've done in the past, but we can we can still do better is to make sure that we're all pulling in the same direction on this because what's very clear is we haven't got any time to wait and to and to waste. So Paul, if we can pop onto the next slide. Great. So I'm, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time, but part of the, the reason for having this slide is just to show that uh, as Luke said, there's an awful lot happening in this space and it's incumbent on all of us, I think, to to see the common thread, to see the, the, the links that exist between them uh, and that people are cited on work that is happening. So for those who don't know, the, the UK government last uh, January published Maritime 2050, which is the first cross-sector long-term strategy for the sector. And last July published the Clean Maritime Plan, which was the UK's first, uh, sorry, the world's first um, decarbonisation plan for the maritime sector. Now. If we're, if we're being honest, there wasn't a huge amount of investment in that, but it did provide a strategy for, for later pieces of work to, to, to hook onto and to help accelerate developments. And that's happened in the last few months in particular. One of the, the most significant announcements and developments has been around the establishment of Maritime Research and Innovation UK, 
which a number of the projects you'll hear from today have received some funding from. And that's a really important development. But like all of these things, we need to we need to put more money behind that. And that's where our comprehensive spending review bid came in. We were working from July through to the autumn with, uh, with many of you on this call to develop a comprehensive spending review bid. Uh, and, and as many of you know, we were seeking a billion pounds to kickstart this process, which was broken down into R&D funding for moving vessels, but then also uh, investment in green infrastructure. So we see that places like Plymouth have put in a, a shore power or electric charging points in, uh, in the city. It's about developing that, extending that. So we're looking at um, ferries, we're looking at other types of vessels, and we're looking at the infrastructure, not just for batteries, but also for green fuels um, like hydrogen potentially. So there was a significant amount of money in the bid for that. Unfortunately, the day after the Department for Transport submitted the bid that we'd asked them to submit and worked with them to shape, uh, the spending review was pulled um, from being a multi-year review to a single year. So we, we immediately turned our attention to thinking of what opportunities there were, and the 10-point plan was one. And uh, as Luke suggests, we were reflected within that. Clean Maritime was in that plan alongside aviation. And I think that's progress for the sector because we've often been a little bit uh, invisible and forgotten. So that's progress. There was um, there was funding in there for demonstrator uh, vessels and there were other associated offshore uh, wind development project funding, which we'll cover today. Uh, we've lost the presentation, uh, Paul. Um, we can see your screen. At least there was nothing dodgy uh, on your on your inbox there. But um, so that's that's where we find ourselves. And I think our job here today is to make a compelling case for the comprehensive spending review when it comes around next July. We know there will need to be one. There hasn't been one for a long time. Uh, we've got the time now to make sure that argument is as compelling as possible. And the way that we, we understand we can best do that is by both showing the tangible, real examples that exist today, and also demonstrating what more can be achieved with further government funding. And just to give you an idea of the scale of transformation that we think the investment would, would give, the billion pounds that we were seeking, and that wasn't the end of the story, it was about unlocking industry funding too, would have created in the order of 75,000 green jobs. And these are green jobs primarily in coastal areas, in regions like the Southwest. So our strategy as a sector is to, is to keep the pressure on, to work to develop that business case and smart case for further investment when opportunities arise. But we do that through showing what's already been achieved with what's been given and demonstrate what more we can do. So that's very much the context. Clearly, we've got a COP being hosted in the UK in the autumn, and we're going to use this as a sector, and the region has an opportunity to benefit in two key ways. The first way, we'll use it as a shop window for some of the great stuff that's already happening, and the Southwest really is at the forefront of that in the UK. But we'll also be wanting to put pressure on the government in the same way as it it did this autumn to show climate leadership, to put its money where its mouth is further than it has done already, because we know that the ambition that we share can't be met without significant public investment. So I'll think I'll pause there. Um, happy to, to, to have some questions in a moment, but I think what we're, we're all really here for is to get into the substance of the projects which show the, the region's leadership, the region's um, effectiveness in pulling together already, and we will start that process on the next slide with colleagues from um, Plymouth Boat Trips. And Andy, over to you to talk to us about the fantastic project we have in Plymouth um, with batteries. Over to you, Andy. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks very much, Ben. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity to showcase our exciting and groundbreaking project. Um, I'm the project manager for Plymouth Boat Trips and Voyager Marine. And as Plymouth Boat Trips, we operate eight passenger vessels varying in size from around 20 metres with 240 passengers down to boats carrying about 30 passengers. And on a typical year, we currently carry around 300,000 passengers around this beautiful Plymouth Sound area. And as Voyager Marine, we operate a boatyard across the water in Cornwall at Millbrook on the River Tamar. And over the past 40 years, the yard has built many of the passenger vessels operating around the UK. 
Our passenger vessels operate on a number of routes carrying many thousands of passengers on commuter trips to and from work or school or to trips to the beach. We also operate a number of small work boats, including the one you see above, which is why I'm really here. She is the first fully electric seagoing passenger vessel to operate in the UK, and she can carry 12 passengers. This vessel is being used as a feasibility study to help us to improve, to, to move from this eight meter prototype craft to larger passenger vessels. Uh, we've worked closely with regulators to establish rules and regulations to enable her to be developed. And in particular, we've worked closely with the MCA, both locally and at the Southampton HQ. And we're also working with Bureau Veritas in particular with their class rules for electrification. The aim is to create a fleet of vessels capable of being clean, fully electric, zero emission. The E-Voyager was converted to fully electric propulsion and launched in October 2020. You saw earlier, she was fitted with a, an old 60 horsepower diesel engine, together with a num number of other rather dated features. We stripped her to bear hull and rebuilt her over a period of three months, and she's now a very smart new vessel, fully powered by electric. We're using lithium ion batteries and a direct drive 140 kilowatt motor to propel her at speeds of up to around eight knots. The systems have been chosen to be robust and capable of use on larger vessels to enable us to transfer the technology and learning directly into other vessels within our fleet and further onto other operators' vessels in this vital 24-metre commercial sector. We have designed the system to enable us to operate for a normal full day of service on a single overnight charge. The partners we've been working with have really helped us with this project. So we've been working with a couple of universities, both at Plymouth and Exeter, and other local companies, including Cambridge Propellers and EV Parts. And as has been mentioned by Ben earlier on, we have received funding to help us with this project and support from uh, MBTC, Mary UK, Impact Labs, and particular support from Plymouth City Council with the uh, provision of charging facilities. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. We have worked with the University of Plymouth and have measured the emissions of our vessels and have identified that our fleet of eight vessels produces approximately 375 tonnes of CO2 per year, as well as many other pollutants. Removing the old diesel engine and creating a clean vessel means more than just a reduction in emissions though. It creates a clean working environment with reduced maintenance and a more pleasant atmosphere for passengers with near silent running. Next slide, please. Through Innovate UK funding and support, we are looking now to convert the vessel on the left, which is the Plymouth Princess. Uh, she is a vessel capable of carrying 103 passengers and will be the first full-size domestic passenger vessel to be zero carbon, fully electric within the UK. On the right is the, the famous Kremel ferry who operates between uh, Plymouth and Kremel in Cornwall. This is a vital commuter link. We are working with a Southwest based naval architects practice to design a fully electric zero carbon vessel. This vessel, this, sorry, this design will then go on to be used for the construction of the UK's first purpose built fully electric zero carbon passenger vessel. This and ongoing developments are made possible through partnerships and close working relationships with a wide variety of organizations. Our plans are to continue with the development of the systems and to offer a commercially viable solution for zero carbon, fully electric commercial vessels in this vital under 24 meter sector. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Andy. And, and 
it's the, it's the first time I've seen the the second stage of the plan where we're looking at the uh, the the conversion of the the other vessels there. So I think that's really that's really welcome. Um, We've got a few minutes, folks, after each project, if anybody would like to ask any questions of, of the speaker. Um, otherwise, I, I've got one myself. I can't see it at the moment, but I've got a question, Andy. What's the, clearly this is, you talk about being the first in the UK here at this point, but I think we'll all be quite, uh, we'll all be quite, quite clear that this is, this is relatively small within the grand scheme of where we need to get to. What's the, what's going to be the, the thing that unlocks that that uh, I guess the progress toward the the scale of transition that we need to see and, and, and the technologies you're producing here can they be scaled up to the larger sorts of vessels that we see coming into Plymouth and other places? Yeah thanks thanks Ben. Um, first of all just in terms of time scales you say it's the first time you've seen these plants the um, the Plymouth Princess the vessel on the left we will be converting during this winter period um, so although uh, it's relatively new we are looking to progress fairly quickly with this. The technology, technology we have um, chosen to um, install into these vessels is really suitable for uh, those vessels that are operating with uh, duty cycles that allow them to charge pretty much on a daily basis. Um, and those which are running at hull speeds or below, um, so displacement vessels, uh, which actually um, comprises a, a significant number of the working vessels operating around the UK. This under 24 metre sector could, could include the passenger vessels like our own, or it could be some of the inshore fishing vessels or work boats, all of which have a, have a daily cycle which allows them to, to come in and charge for periods during, the, during a 24 hour uh, day cycle. And, and the technology that we're using fits perfectly into this. It's robust technology that has actually transferred across from the road transport sector. Um, so it's already been used. And it's a bit, if you look at how um, diesel engines evolved, it's, it's sort of a similar in a way to that, in that uh, the diesel engines that most of us use in these vessels have come from the truck and bus type industry or tractor industry. Um, and we're, in a, in a way, adopting a similar approach in that we're using those robust um, motors that have, have been used already in, in the commercial world. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Andrew. We've got a question here. I think we'll, we'll probably need to make it the, the uh, well, there's a couple of questions just come in. I think we, we don't want to limit the time for people later on, but I think if, if you can see these, Andy, in the side, are you able to, to pick those up? The question from Jeff is around, uh, I guess it's the question around shore power. What's the, yeah. uh, over to you. Yep, okay, I, I see the question from Jeff, which um, is aware, presumably the vessel needs to be alongside for overnight charging. Uh, it needs to be um, alongside for charging for a period during its cycle. So that could be overnight or it could be for a number of times during the day, depending on the nature of the duty cycle of the, the vessel. Uh, but the aim is for, for these to be fully electric and not hybrid, so uh, the bulk of the charging would need to come from from uh, plug-in uh, shore power. Um, ben, you asked a little bit about what sort of assistance would be, would be useful in, as we move forward. And yeah. really it's that, that focus on uh, a shore-based infrastructure, um, which is absolutely essential. We've, we've been fortunate and Plymouth City Council have been really supportive in, in the early stages of, of this development. But I think as we, as we go beyond the, the bounds of Plymouth, actually we need a, a, a more holistic, you know, a, more, a greater, um, input from central government, perhaps uh, looking at how infrastructure could be placed in ports to encourage this movement from uh, diesel to fully electric solutions where it's applicable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, thanks, Andy. Um, I tell you what, we'll do that. There's a question in the Q and A about batteries versus hydrogen, which I think what if, if everyone's okay with it, what I'd like to do is I'll come to that at the end because I think it might be a theme that we get to when we look at some of the other solutions. But just if we take off these questions in the side at the moment, uh, we've got a question um, from from Mark Turner at Bayes, is to what extent, if you wouldn't mind sort of say, your engagement has been with Bayes. Uh, and then we've got one from you and Cameron about the, the range, how far these vessels can go. I guess that's the capacity of the batteries. And then if we take that, uh, and then if you, you're welcome to, to respond to Chris's question as well, and then we'll we'll draw a line under this section, if that's okay, Andy. Right. Um, yeah, I'll pick up on uh, Chris's um, question first of all. 
which is that I'm aware of the Norwegian ferries, but I do wonder if they're as close to being a commercial reality as PBT boats are. Uh, that, that's a really good question because um, what we've really tried to do with, with our development is to make it a vi commercially viable uh, solution. And whilst we are getting some support from uh, Innovate UK and Marry UK for, for these projects, what we're looking to do is to actually develop a product that would be commercially viable for most people to operate with. And I think if we look at how the Norwegians have provided the funding for theirs, that their solutions, whilst um, uh, really um, fantastic solutions, are commercially really difficult to, to justify for an operator without massive continued public support. And I think the really big difference for, for us is that the solutions we believe that we've identified are those which are likely to be viable in the long term for operators just like ourselves. Um, what was the next one? Um, so have, you, have we had conversa conversations with Innovate UK? Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, we have. Um, we've, um, in, in fact, the, the funding for the two vessels that are on the screen at the moment have, have come through from uh, Innovate UK uh, grants support. So um, there, there is funding for us to convert uh, the Plymouth Princess and also for the design work for the uh, new Kremel Ferry. So we, we have worked with those and we've worked with uh, Marry UK as well. Um, so we are talking to, to the, most of the, the organisations that we're aware Great. of the hub. Thanks, uh, Andy. And, uh, then, and then that final question was around the, uh, the, the range of the vessel with the current oh, yeah. technology. Yeah, so what, we've, what we're looking to try to do um, at all times, because of the nature of our service really, where we have very short term turnaround periods, uh, whilst we're tied up alongside, we're not, we're not actually making any uh, money. Uh, we make the money from actually taking passengers on, on uh, voyages, either for pleasure or for uh, commuter services. So the, the less time we have tied up alongside, the better it is for us. So what we, we've looked to do is to provide sufficient range for us to operate during it for our normal day period. So in the case of the Plymouth Princess, we're looking at about a 12 hour duty cycle. And for the Kremel Ferry, a bit longer, it's about 14 hours. Um, and these are, these are viable and, and achievable, um, we believe, because the vessels aren't high speed. They're operating, as I, as I did mention, at uh, around hull speed or just slightly below a displacement craft. So that they're relatively economic vessels to, um, to actually push through the water. Uh, and therefore, for, for our solution, they're absolutely, uh, absolutely viable. You know, it's an absolutely viable solution for us to have uh, identified. Great. Okay. Well, what we'll do clearly, there's a huge, huge number of questions here, which we can we could spend hours on each project. Probably, what we'll do, we want to whet the appetite, provide some answers. But I think we'll we'll collect all these questions and we'll do a bit of homework as well after this, and we'll come back round with everybody with a. Uh, with a list of questions and answers to each project. I think this is about sharing knowledge, sharing awareness, and ensuring that people on this call can go away and be advocates for not only the specific projects, but the, the mission that we all share here. So uh, if I can, I'll draw a line under that and say thanks very much, Andy, for that. It was um, really useful, really interesting. Thanks everybody for their questions. We'll do our best to get as many as we can in, but we'll need to move on so we can fit everybody in. Paul, if we could move to the, the next slide, please. We have colleagues from uh, Stunseeker um, with us, so if we could move on to the next slide. Oh no, we don't. Sorry, sorry, I've uh, I've jumped. We've got Martin first. He's going to talk to us about hydrogen fuel cells from uh, City College. Over to you, Martin. Yes, hi, um, and welcome to City College Plymouth. Uh, City College Plymouth has been uh, part of the HE. Uh, community for the good past few years. Uh, the FE community here at City College is very robust and the HE community is now growing at an exponential level, especially within our uh, engineering department. 95% uh, of our students come from industry. Uh, they are following either an upskilling uh, platform uh, supported by their company or they're part of a higher apprenticeship uh, standard. Uh, that again is with their company. Uh, this growth in our uh, HE community for engineering sees us in Q1 of next year, hopefully moving into our new development at Ocean's Gate, which is a massive development with part of uh, the growth in Plymouth 
itself. Uh, this this uh, reallocation or relocation for us in, in Plymouth is supported by the Institute of Technology uh, and we'll be one of the first IoT funded projects to complete early in Q1 next year. I'm here to talk about the, what we do with our students and our, each year our students, uh, our, our third year final year students, uh, they get involved with a project to do with marine autonomy. Marine autonomy is a massive growth industry here in Plymouth, and therefore we, we want to engage our students with that technology at a very early stage. Uh, this year, very, very uniquely, we will be actually using hydrogen fuel cells uh, to power our uh, marine autonomous vessels. Uh, we see it as a, the possible alternative solution to the, in, within the autonomy sector, especially with the, uh, these hydrogen fuel cells becoming more and more compact and powerful. So this year we will have six teams, each with four students. Uh, each student will come from a specific area within the HE engineering sector, be it mechanical, marine, naval architecture or marine autonomy. And their project is to design and build a fully autonomous vessel with a length overall of two meters. Uh, and with the unique develop development for this project this year is that they must be powered by a hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, all the technology that we utilize within our, our marine autonomous vessels uh, is available technology. We're just using them in an innovative way. So for instance, our hydrogen fuel cells will be coming from the UAV market. Um, and I'll talk about our suppliers in a little bit. But basically all the technology that we run is off the shelf. Um, and therefore it's about creating the compatibility um, between those systems. So what is the research? Well, the research is about identifying the issues surrounding the fuel cells in the marine environment. They're not designed to be used within the marine environment. They're actually, like I said, UAV uh, hydrogen fuel cells. Um, and the students will be finding out what uh, the issues are surrounding having these fuel cells in the marine environment. They will be able to then uh, pass that information on to our partners uh, for future development uh, for using hydrogen fuel cells within this sector. One thing that I'm really encouraging our students to do, although it's a, it's a sort of competition-based teamwork, is that they're working in their own little clusters of also their academic uh, understanding, so the naval architects, the marine engineers. And what they're doing is they're, instead of just working in a silo, they're designing or they're researching within their particular expertise boundaries. Uh, and they're sharing that information, which we see is vitally important of actually uh, generating innovation very, very quickly. Rather than just having one person innovating, you can have, we're having like seven naval architects designing hulls, seven mechanical engineers working on uh, the outputs and inputs within the hydrogen fuel cells systems. Um, and creating that data, that qualitative and quantitative data that uh, we can see uh, real gains and real interest innovation going forward. We're using three different manufacturing uh, manufacturers of fuel cell. They range from a UK-based company to a Polish-based company, and then uh, we, we're actually partnered with a massive company out in America uh, that is a specialist in this area. And they're also using us as a, uh, a platform to develop a possible solution to hydrogen fuel cells within the marine industry. Uh, at the moment, all the students are uh, creating uh, and comparing their manufacturer's data as, and we will then develop and record our own data to compare what we're actually getting uh, from the manufacturers and actually what we see in real world, real life environmental testing. Um, they're at this moment, they're actually bench testing a lot of the equipment to find out where the losses are in the systems to find out where the, the problems may occur in the systems. And this is vital knowledge to pass on to our partners in the future. So uh, who are our partners in this project? Well, we have got uh, Mari UK, 
they funded the project, a huge investment from them, which was fantastic, which meant that we were able to go out and purchase uh, these hydrogen fuel cells, and they come at a fair, fair price. Um, we're working with Exeter University, Penryn Campus. Uh, their Penryn Campus is their center for uh, renewable energy. Uh, and they, although they've not used hydrogen fuel cells in the marine environment, they are familiar with hydrogen fuel cells. And then obviously supporting us with that knowledge is uh, invaluable. We have two companies that are very, very supportive of us and interested in our results, Autonaut and Unmanned Survey Solutions. Uh, they, they have been part of this project ever since the, 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 the start, and they're keen to look at our outputs from this uh, particular project. And then obviously as a member of the FAST cluster, which is the Future Autonomy at Sea Technology cluster here in Plymouth, which is now consisting of over 40 companies or research uh, establishments in this area, um, is it that they're supporting this with whatever they, they can, and they're incredibly interested in the results out of it. The hydrogen fuel cell is currently a possibility, but because of the initial cost of purchasing all the equipment, it's quite a, uh, a scary proposition. And being able to give that information to them uh, to develop their own platforms further is going to be vital to grow the hydrogen fuel cell usage within the marine sector. So that's the end of my pr presentation. I know it's quite brief and uh, I open up the floor to questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Martin. Um, just first one from me. We, we've seen a lot from the government around hydrogen um, in that 10 point plan where it painted a picture of the future. It speaks of uh, vessels and aeroplanes being powered by hydrogen and there was funding announced I forget the exact amount I think it was a couple of hundred million pounds hydrogen fund to develop uh, hydrogen technologies is that something that is appropriate and relevant to yourselves in the sector and if so do you think it's something that you'll be bidding into or working or looking for partners to bid into I mean, for this for this pro uh, project, we've got all the partners that we're working with, and that's part of the Maori UK bid. Um, we hope to extend the project into a year two, possibly year three, with even larger vessels. Um, and I've already been in contact with the Knowledge Transfer Network about how we can utilise other uh, other areas to partner with and grow this information pool um, larger than just what we're working for at this moment. Okay, thanks. I guess it's one for us all to keep an eye on because if there's there's funds available, we want to make sure it's coming to our sector as well. So perhaps we'll be in touch to see how we can can do that. Uh, Luke, uh, you've got a you've got a question. Yeah, this is fantastic, and it's great seeing that City College is expanding into Oceansgate, which I think is going to get a real reputation nationally for the type of innovative work that you're doing. Um, can I just ask about the skills pipeline? Because if this is the future for marine uh, and maritime in terms of autonomy and uh, alternative energy sources, we're going to need to train up a lot more people at entry level coming into the sector. How many how many jobs uh, do you think are, are going to be created in this area, and, and how do you think colleges like City College can can help respond to the the need that is going to be created in terms of our skills pipeline? So obviously the the skills gap, the skills pipeline is 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 a, a big growth area for us at City College. Um, I don't have the numbers of what the potential for growing the hydrogen uh, into you know, the hydrogen sector in this area are for recruitment. All I can say is that with Ocean's Gate, um, the, the, we'll be the, uh, possibly the largest uh, company within Ocean's Gate. Uh, we'll be a state-of-the-art facility with plenty of room for expansion. Um, so we have, we're already partnered with Babcock, MOD. We even have uh, students coming down from Abbey Woods to study with us because we offer some really unique courses uh, we are the only college in the country that offers a foundation degree in naval architecture. Um, we're the only college in the country that offers anything to do with marine autonomy. Um, all our, all our uh, BSCs, FDS, FDSCs and HNCs are, are, are accredited by Plymouth University as well. Um, we, it, it's about creating that grassroots knowledge for us. Uh, with our students that we have and that we want to see grow into uh, this sector. Um, 
from there, what I've learned with my limited experience within education is once you get that burgeoning knowledge within those young people, what they do with it in their career is the critical element of growth. Uh, thanks very much, Martin. I think one thing we, we might want to do is do a bit of a briefing on this because hydrogen has rapidly uh, risen up the agenda and you guys are clearly at the forefront of that and thinking of its application to this sector. And I think we need to be clear about what the opportunity is and how we capitalise on it, particularly with that, that funding that was announced. Uh, there's a couple more questions, then we'll, we'll move on to the next. We've got a question from Charles Hall here, which asks about how hydrogen will be produced sustainably. Will it be done, do you en envisage, in, in local production sites or uh, specifically for maritime, or is it done in some other way? So, so for this project, um, we are sourcing our hydrogen from uh, a local gas producer, BOC Gases. Um, we're trying to keep the project simple. Uh, it's about the, the outputs from the, the actual cells researching. Uh, and we're already finding that a lot of the data supplied by the manufacturers is not actually what we're finding in our real world testings. Um, the, the growth of actually producing hydrogen um, there, is a, there is a project that we're looking at where we're going to try and uh, produce enough hydrogen from seawater through separation and desalination um, to create a sustainable platform that produces its own, uh, own enough hydrogen to power itself. Um, we're in the very, very early stages of the, in, the research in that. Um, the maths adds up at this moment in time. Um, does it work in a real world environment? We're not sure, but the, the maths adds up. Okay. That's really interesting. And, and I think with a nod to what, what's, what's been announced recently in terms of a hydrogen hub up in the Northeast, to, and then how Maritime feeds into that, do you, do you see the technologies that you're, you're looking at? Are you looking at how the existing technologies can be explored and, and used in a Maritime marine context, or is it is it something that's new and, and is therefore unique to maritime? The question is sort of really, uh, what's the read across to other modes of transport? And is that something you're thinking about? And then I think we'll have to pause there, folks. Uh, that's fine. I mean, uh, what we do uh, within the college environment with our foundation degree students is expose them to as many different technologies as possible. Um, and don't... we because of the way that unfortunately sometimes the maritime sector is funded, uh, we see developments within technology, with innovation, within certain other uh, areas, uh, aerospace and so uh, you know, it's, uh, different uh, you know, spaces like that. Um, what we try and encourage is our students to go out and find that technology and then apply it in a very unique and, and, uh, way within the mar maritime sector. Um, so, Basically, a lot of our technology comes from UAVs, uh, aerospace industry, um, that we're actually then applying it to the maritime sector. Um, okay. Thanks, Martin. That's really, really interesting. I, I think hydrogen is something we're going to hear a huge amount more of, and I think we'll be in touch to make sure that the work you're doing is, is, being, uh, is being shared and people can collaborate and partner with you on this, because you seem to be at the at the forefront of this. Um, so, so thanks very much, Martin. Uh, moving on, I've tried to bring colleagues from Sunsea Green already, and I'll, I'll try again now. So, uh, Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, can I have the first slide, please? So, just for those of you who don't do, know too much about Sunseeker, um, a really very brief overview. I mean, we're proud um, to have established one of the most recognisable brands in, in the marine leisure sector. And we remain a British manufacturing company with all of our operations uh, and, and business um, functions led from our headquarters um, based in Poole. And all of our manufacturing is, um, is carried out at our sites um, in and around the area of Poole and the Southwest. It, it's through the export of 99% of our products um, that we continue to form an integral part of business um, and an industry in the Southwest region. Um, can I have the next slide? So, as one might expect, we've got an ongoing program of um, product development 
and and more and more so there's at least an interest on in how we might integrate some of the carbon reduction technologies um, that are becoming much more widespread certainly in the automotive sector but in the general transport sector um, certainly some of the bus and truck type applications are really um, able to be scaled directly to our kind of products um, and as well as our business ambitions of, of growth um, we really need to start to deliver the kinds of products that, um, that align more and more with the values and ideas um, of our clients as well as the um, as well as the wider industry can I have the next slide thank you um, I mean further to this it's it's through the delivery of, of the right products that, that we want to secure the future of um, of our British manufacturing sites as far as possible I would like to show two specific innovations um, that will be some of the first um, in the pleasure yacht sector. And we anticipate that, that these sorts of innovations will continue to pave the way for, for much greater carbon reduction technologies being um, widespread, even throughout the um, pleasure sector, such as ours. Next slide, please. So here we can see the, the latest generation of our 60 foot, um, 65 foot, um, sports yacht. Um, obviously, as well as being a, a beautifully stunning sports cruiser, it's designed from the outset to utilize lithium battery um, storage and, and onboard power management systems so that we can start to offer to all of our clients the um, advantages of being able to operate the vessel um, electrical power systems with zero emissions. So it, it's distinguished from some similar types of vessels by utilizing onboard battery technology to, um, to provide zero emissions um, electrical power without having to rely on the onboard diesel generators. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So the next innovation, it takes this concept one, one step further. So uh, as well as being able to generate electrical power on board, um, this um, innovation in partnership with um, Rolls-Royce Power Systems, it, it utilizes the same lithium battery and power management technologies, but extends this to be able to enable the vessel to be operated for periods of time with um, zero emissions for propulsion as well as for power generation. So this is realistically the first step into introducing zero emissions um, pleasure yachting. And um, it's, it's creating a system that's, um, that's commercially viable. And as I mentioned, it is aligned with um, our clients' own values and their expectations of the technology. Can I have the next slide, please? So as these technologies mature, we would expect to be able to continue to incorporate these things to offer a, a wider range of, um, of our types of vessels that incorporate these kinds of systems and products. Um, it, it's reasonable to assume that um, that as time moves on, the, the emphasis on, on zero carbon is going to become a greater um, driver as to our overall um, product design. And we will expect to start to consider um, energy efficiency and the incorporation of new technologies more and more as, um, as time goes on. But we continue to expect to try and serve multiple subsectors in, in order to um, deliver as broad a range of product as, uh, as we possibly can that, um, that meet important, say, important environmental standards and, and legislation as, as, as these things develop. Can I have the final slide, please? So beyond 10 years, um, 
as expectations and legislation evolve, we just would expect to um, carbon reduction technologies to to be an integral part of the overall design. So, in or, in order to really see the benefits of this, we'd have to think of a uh, a bottom up approach to um, delivering energy efficiency um, to trans which would transform the the sort of um, the expectation of, of how um, pleasure yachting would be in the future, and there will be much more emphasis on um, on making efficiency savings, not just in electrical um, power consumption, but also um, in how efficient the, the vessel moves through the water. So the hull design, the propulsion system design, um, really changing the shape and style of, of our kinds of products to um, enable maybe um, solar cells to be flatted up, to be fitted on um, flat surfaces and really maximize the, the available energy sources to, to um, move towards fully electrified products and, and products that um, really are truly zero emissions um, and, and to make pleasure yachting a sustainable activity um, for the future. Um, that's it. I'm open to any questions. Uh, Great. Thanks very much, Andrew. Yeah. I think the, the 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 point that's clear to see here is that this is a challenge that clearly the whole economy is 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 facing, an opportunity that is that exists. But that's so true within the maritime sector too. You've got we've got it happening within the Royal Navy. We've got it happening as we've seen there on uh, a little bit more. We're looking at the ferries on a sort of a, a commercial and passenger basis, and we've got it happening looking at hydrogen and we've got it here on the, the leisure side and I think there's probably no uh, you know, save the Solent but perhaps not there's no region of the UK that is that is more uh, at the heart of, of the leisure um, side of the sector and it's great to see the, the thought and the, the activity that's actually happening in, in here too particularly for, for Sunseeker. Uh, could I, I've, got a, I've got a few questions here I'm, what we can do for panellists is if, if you're happy to answer the questions in the Q&A um, at the same time, um, that means we can sort of get through more of these. Um, but th there is a general one here that I want to—I'd like to pick up if possible, Andrew. Is, is how have you? Uh, there's a question here about propulsion system. It's come up a few times. It's uh, and, and lots of different commentators and different people are talking about hybrid. They're talking about batteries. They're talking about hydrogen. They're talking about and, and uh, within hydrogen, talking about ammonia. How have you? How have you settled on 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 batteries, and, and have you do you see it as being the the solution for for all parts of the your, your portfolio? Um, we we haven't really, so to say, settled on batteries. We want to just utilise the commercially available technology that's that's um, that can move us in the right direction and use it as a learning exercise to um, understand how we could better. Um, answer some of these sorts of challenges. I mean, the, the type of, um, we're really responding to our clients' demands as well as the environmental demands. And we're trying to um, really deliver systems that are based on proven existing technology um, and, and that are commercially um, off the shelf type products that, and available now so that we can answer some of these we could be first to market with with some of these kinds of solutions. So it's, I think just the utilization of lithium batteries is a first step and a, and a, and a sort of toe in the water, if you like. Uh, as I mentioned towards the end of my presentation, I think there needs to be a transition um, across the whole of the sector, really, a, a change of mindset to that would enable us to, to look at um, hydrogen and other technologies that might become available in the future. But we really need to start to think about the pleasure boat, um, not as it is now, but how it will be in the future and then um, align the appropriate technologies um, throughout the, the, the whole design of those kinds of vessels. No, understood. Uh, thanks very much. And, and just a, a final question here, I think, which might be worth trying to cover at this point is to what extent uh, and this is from Petra Spot who, who, who are uh, helping do the a nice write-up of this for us uh, will the relatively short lifespan of lithium-ion batteries uh, be a drawback in moving the technology to commercial scale I, I guess that latter point is one that I've 
I've always been interested in to what extent can technologies that are being developed in one part of the sector be be read across and, and benefit other parts. Is that do, do you have a, a sense of where technology is at the moment and, and where that barrier will be? Um, and, and and when you talk about other technologies or other fuels, perhaps like hydrogen, have you do, do you have a, a sense of where the barrier is going to be uh, and, and what what the sort of the, the time scale might be that we need to see more deployable solutions available. Um, I, th I think on the time scale, I think we're in, in a fortunate area a sector of the industry where um, our product isn't really um, used in a, in the way a commercial type product would be. So I think from a purely operation of vessel perspective, let's face it, leisure leisure marine boats really really don't get used. Um, that much. At the larger end, uh, as is regularly mentioned here, yes, I think um, we would need to look to um, other technologies to realistically deliver um, sort of commercial levels of, of performance. But uh, our types of applications are really occasional use of the of the vessel and um, relatively short operational periods as well. So even though there's plenty of facilities and um, and onboard conveniences, most of our products are used um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So lithium would, would suit the types of applications that we look at for, for our products at this point in time. Customers would use their boat during the day, look to um, operate with zero emissions, but then plug into shore power and, and, and recharge and, and gain the benefits of a, of a plug-in style. Um, power source. So um, it's not necessarily um, a concern, but as as more um, as different technologies emerge with different um, sorts of sure. benefits, sure. Then, then we'll. Okay. Of well, thank, thanks. Thanks very much for that. We, there's, there's a question in the chat you wouldn't mind uh, replying to in your own time, which is, uh, I guess, whether the the design of the vessel is uh, no doubt something you're thinking about, but there's a there's a question there from you and Campbell about, uh, sorry, Cameron about um, what you you may or may not have thought about there, and it'd be useful if you get the chance to to respond there. Otherwise, we can we can come back to everybody with the answers to these. Thanks very much okay. uh, to colleagues from from Sunsley to there. Uh, moving on, uh, we we've got a presentation now from the RNLI, um, which uh, is very boldly framed as around the next 200 years and about making life saving sustainable. So. Uh, let's hand over. Let's see where we. Victoria, can you can you can you can you see us and hear us? Hopefully, yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, over to you. Excellent. Um, hello. So I'm the energy manager for the uh, Royal National Lifeboat Institution, and um, we go to slide two. For those of you who don't know the Iron Line terribly well, we thought this video would be a really effective way of introducing ourselves. Hopefully, it's going to run and may or may not have sound, so we shall see. So apologies, it looks like we missed out on our dramatic music, but um, hopefully it was it was it was um, came across well. So um, the majority of our life saving fundraising and engagement work is undertaken by a fantastic crew of volunteers, some of whom you see in this slide. 
um, and that represents in the region of around 50,000 people across the UK and Ireland. Um, and we also employ about 2,000 staff across the organisation. And as well as those um, pictured on this beach who are involved in operational support roles, we have a specialist engineering department. And this enables us to design, build and maintain our own lifeboats. And we have factories in Poole in Dorset, in Cowes on the Isle of Wight and uh, now in Mid Wales. So we also have an estate team who manage all of our new construction and refurbishment building projects. And we maintain our assets through regional engineering teams. Um, we believe that the RLI have a unique platform for trials and testing outside of some of the commercial complexities, and we're really keen to share our experience in designing, building, owning and operating a complex portfolio of assets to support development of low carbon solutions. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, so we celebrate our bicentenary in 2024, and in planning this, it provides us with an excellent opportunity to set our ambitions for the next 200 years. Our volunteers, supporters and staff expect us to operate to the highest moral codes and this expectation has defined our overarching sustainability vision, which is to operate as a good citizen in all of our activities to sustain and secure our future. And to that end, we've set four key ambitions which are outlined in this slide and they have timelines to coincide with our bicentenary in 2024 um, to ensure that we don't delay and we start now and then to keep us moving forward um, to 2030, 2040 and 2050, coincide, but hopefully so slightly ahead of the large national government target. Um, we are very much at the beginning of this carbon reduction journey, um, but it will be a critical element in ensuring that our life saving work is sustainable for the next 200 years and beyond. I could have the next slide, please. So um, renewable energy is of course a massive part of achieving any direct um, carbon emission reductions and all suitable renewable technologies installed as part of our standard highly efficient building specifications. Wherever we build or refurbish a facility, um, we will install as much of the renewable technology that is available and practical at the time. Um, our first solar arrays were installed in 2011 and these were generally paired with ground or water source heat pumps. Our renewables portfolio is of course backed by a robust business case especially because it's funded from supporters donations. And the early installations have delivered a seven year payback on their original nine year business case, which means that we will have at least 18 years of truly cost and carbon free energy from those alone. Um, so these technologies make a solid financial investment, even with the feed-in tariff disappearing, and even before you start to factor in carbon reduction drivers. Um, so we now have a portfolio of 28 solar installations and 30 heat pumps, and that increases year on year. And our installed solar power contributes about 3% of our total electricity consumption. And we have a 20 kilowatt wind turbine at our northmost um, station in Ace in Shetland. In terms of marine fuel consumption, um, our engineers are constantly improving the fuel and energy efficiency of our vessels. But this alone will not be enough to get us anywhere near to zero carbon. Um, alternative propulsion methods and fuels are the next step. But unfortunately, at the moment, the capability to reach a casualty as quickly and reliably as our crews need is not currently feasible from anything other than our diesel or petrol fueled boats. But given the speed of progress in this field, as we're seeing today, um, we're already designing in flexibility to accommodate future installation of electric charging points or hydrogen storage um, or whatever else we may need to adapt to in the future. Um, the ability to truly reduce carbon emissions through on-site renewable generation, battery storage, electric vehicles or boats, or to facilitate hydrogen fuel tanks or whatever else the future holds, will require extensive infrastructure changes alongside a reliable renewable energy supply. And due to the nature of our life-saving activities, the majority of our locations are really remote and often right at the bottom of the list of areas that are flagged for infrastructure enhancement. So we see ourselves as being well positioned to be the catalyst for the installation of charging and hydrogen storage or other infrastructure in those more remote ports and coastal locations. If I could have the next slide, please. So the transition to alternative propulsion methods, as again as I mentioned before, also demands a programme of upskilling of our own existing engineering staff, but it will also fundamentally change the nature of the future employment and volunteering, um, which will offer new opportunities for our local communities and working in this organisation full of skilled staff and volunteers from every walk of life 
gives us a huge advantage of breadth of vision and heritage. And if you've ever had the chance to watch some of our cruise dramatic rescues, you'll know that there are very few challenges that the RNLI can't tackle, especially when the impacts of climate change, such as extreme weather, coastal erosion, rising sea levels and flooding are already tangibly manifesting themselves in the environment that we operate in today. If I could have the last slide, please. So I hope that's given you a bit of insight into some of the ambitions, opportunities and challenges that the RNLI face as we all move to a low carbon future and also reflect some of our enthusiasm um, for the path ahead, accepting the challenges. So I'd like to leave you with this quote from our founder, Sir William Hillary, which we think resonates as much with the current climate challenges as with the devastating loss of drowning, of life to drowning that he was addressing when he first spoke these words 200 years ago. Thank you. And if there's any questions, thanks very much, Victoria. Um, I think I think Mark's touched on a, a point I was going to ask about, which is that well, one a reflection that we don't always have to look to overseas demand for some of the solutions to this. I mean, if you as an operator, um, you you will work with the with the most uh, suitable um, provider for your for your circumstance. But uh, the opportunity to to build that, uh, uh, I guess that proposition with, with domestic providers is one that is sustainable uh, on a different level as well. And uh, Mark's question there is, are you already working, you know, there's been a huge amount of focus from the Prime Minister and others, particularly in the Southwest, uh, around mm -hmm. shipbuilding and, uh, and, and, and other sort of marine manufacturing. Is that something, are, are you engaged with, with UK yards uh, about uh, low carbon vessels uh, in the future, or is that something you're just starting to, to embark upon? Uh, we're starting, I mean, we have extensive existing networks um, in our engineering department and um, across the organisation. So those links already exist and we're building on those. Um, we're forming an alternative propulsion working group, um, which will network with external, um, anybody that will network with us really, <laughs> um, but currently with external um, research units and experts. So we're sort of trying to draw in as much experience and, and um, insight as possible, because there's, sure. a, there's so many different solutions at the moment that um, yeah. very much are watching brief. Um, but we yeah. also need to make sure that we don't design something out now. So it's, it's all about looking at those opportunities for the next vessel or the next refit um, and how we can make sure that that's mm -hmm. as open to development as possible. So we need to be aware of as, as many of the options that are, are out there as possible. Well, it may well be worth, and I think we can certainly do this, if it's not already there, linking you with colleagues in industry who are working on uh, things around the shipbuilding strategy and looking at what UK capability is uh, and, and feeding that in. So I think that's something we can we can take away. But, and thanks very much for your presentation. And um, what you're hopefully everyone is seeing is that different parts of the sector in, in its broadest sense are all working towards the same goals and the same ambitions and it's it's something that hopefully we can realize greater added value from those links than we otherwise would if everyone was doing this in isolation Absolutely. Uh, wonderful thanks very much uh, moving over now uh we've got colleagues from the university of plymouth to talk about the role of sort of um data in, in, in all of this and again just to show the breadth of the uh the the push that there is uh across the region across the sector so I'll hand over to Kevin, uh, over to you. Thank you, so good evening everybody. I'm Kevin Jones. I'm the Executive Dean of Science and Engineering at the University of Plymouth, and also a head of our Maritime Cyber Threats Research Group. So what I'm gonna talk about is kind of a different aspect of the problem. I think one of the things that, that's become clear as we look more and more at achieving environmentally friendly solutions in the maritime space, we're seeing an increasing use of smart technology. So more computers are being involved in everything from the way we plan and do to actually the operation of various vessels, it's sort of ending at the extreme point in things like autonomous ships. So in order to make sure that we can actually maintain a reasonable approach to doing that in practice, we need to be aware that introducing new technology also introduces new problems and potentially new threats. And one of the things we need to be concerned about is very much sort of the security of the new technologies we're deploying within the sector. So one of the projects that we're running at the University of Plymouth is the Cyber Ship Lab. 
which is a combination of cyber technology combined with maritime operations to really address the problem of being able to appropriately secure everything from individual devices and vessels right up through to the supply chain that will allow goods and services to be brought into the UK. This is a project which has wide collaboration within the sector, ranging from equipment manufacturers, ship and fleet operators, right through to insurers, class societies, technology development. And as it stands today, the project is looking at an investment of over three million pounds. And we expect this to be a collaborative um, venture, which will allow, if you like, UK PLC to be able to address some of the cyber issues that are emerging from the new technologies we're approaching. We have a number of partners involved in this, both um, university level and industry level. And what we're seeing is a different approach to really ensuring that we're not introducing new problems by new solutions. So if we go to the next slide, please. Oh, we missed one, I think. There we go. So what, what we're seeing today is that cyber attacks in the maritime space are growing. Everything from accidental damage, which we've seen has had a huge effect on um, commercial operations within some companies, through to targeted piracy and ransomware, and eventually extending up the level of state-sponsored activity. So we're, we're seeing the problems emerging. We need solutions to be able to look at things like deploying new technology to produce more fuel efficient routes, to produce sort of more fuel efficient vessels, reducing or even eliminating crews. We're seeing that collaboration is not just with industry, but also with the military, particularly in our case, obviously the Navy and defense primes to be able to basically protect against the new threats that are emerging as we're opening up the cyber surface because of new technologies. And in particular, I think in the Southwest, we are very interested in how this capability can help enable next generation thinking around smart ports and autonomous systems. We can show that use of autonomous technology can reduce the overall carbon footprint of everything from shipping to scientific research. And we believe the fully enabling smart ports can again reduce the carbon burden on the sort of the very necessary shipping sector. But in order to be able to do this, we have to be sure that they can be done in a secure way. So the ship lab, we hope will be the the prime focus on enabling solutions to move ahead at the same pace as, as the technology introducing the problems. If you could go to the next slide, please. So more broadly within the university and the academic sector, we are focused on a number of issues, some of which have already been mentioned by previous presenters, students and academic staff working with, for example, um, Plymouth Boat Trips to develop a next generation of vessels suitable for lower carbon operation in the kinds of activity we're looking at. And we've had everything from academic staff at a research level through to student projects working on looking at sort of potential solutions. So everything from naval architecture through clean propulsion are, are activities in which we can support the industry sector in developing these solutions. We're also working with regulators, classification societies, the MCA, to ensure that as we're developing technologies for deployment, there is an appropriate support within a regu regulatory structure to enable them to actually be deployed. We're engaged in measuring the effect of some of these solutions, looking at emissions, but also sort of secondary effects like noise measurement and the overall impact on the ocean environment. And also, of course, developing students who have the right degree of understanding, interest and technological capability to be an active player in developing this industry as it moves forward. And that is everything from employees available in the next generation to existing students working on projects that are directly relevant to solving some of these problems. Next slide, please. 
And, and finally, focusing sort of on a specific aspect of, of sort of reducing carbon in the maritime sector, it is the research going on in the Southwest supporting clean propulsion. The, the Center for Future Clean Mobility, based in Exeter, has been very involved in the project that was mentioned earlier, which has led to production of the first usable solution with electronic drive in the maritime sector. There's expertise in powertrain battery pack design, but also supporting capability around test and optimization, control system design, and so on. And this is now becoming a practical solution. And we're seeing it deployed in what you could see as exemplar projects, which hopefully working with industry will become the standards as the next generation moves forward. There has been significant funding for this center, we're looking at more than a million pounds since the middle of last year, working with many companies. And we believe that the, the academic institutions within the Southwest are very well placed to support the initiatives, both locally, nationally, and indeed globally, to move these technologies forward into the next generation of practical use. So I'll stop there, very happy to answer questions here or later and particularly encourage collaboration around the academic contributions to these sort of very important issues that can help us move the, the, the whole sector forward. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, I, I, really interesting and, and it's good to see the links with the earlier projects and see, I think it's, uh, I think we all recognise that the UK has a, a global lead when it comes to a lot of the, the academic uh, and, and research strands of this and I think it's fair to say that the, on the industrial basis we've, we're a little bit behind the curve in some areas of the sector in terms of international competition so leveraging one to support the other is a really really important thing for us to be able to do and I think it's great to see those collaborations there. Uh, I can't see any questions at the moment from, from colleagues but um, if you do have anything specifically for, for Kevin and, and his colleagues do just use the, the sidebar for the Q&A. Conscious of time I think we'll We'll push on to our final example of what's happening already uh, in the region, and, and then we'll move on to the three really exciting projects that we want people on this call to work together to help uh, bring to fruition. Uh, but if I can, I bring in Ken. He's going to talk a bit about how uh, the automotive sector that is, by all accounts, ahead of us, and I think it's fair to say is ahead of the, the maritime sector in terms of this journey to net zero what we can learn from that and how we can leverage the technology that's being used there uh, for, for this sector. So over to you, Ken. Okay, and thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. Um, one of the benefits of going last is that you get to see what everybody else has been up to. Uh, and I'm very impressed with the, the amount of progress that has been made in this area over the last couple of years. So if we could have the first slide, please. Um, my, my background is uh, a marine engineer, um, starting with the Navy and moving on from there. Um, and I've worked for some time in Brussels on long-term maritime research strategy. I've run a number of uh, EU R&D projects and Innovate UK projects. Um, but what I want to focus on tonight is what is, is, is the near term, um, what is accessible, touchable, usable in the next um, five, five to 10 years. And what I find very interesting is the parallels between what's happening in the automotive industry, which is essentially driving this technology, and what is needed in the marine sector, and how much of a crossover there is, um, and indeed how much of a crossover there isn't. So if you look firstly at the electric vehicle sector, um, Tesla is always hitting the headlines. It's one of their cars in the photograph there. Uh, and then you look at the picture in the bottom, that's a, um, a power catamaran, big boat, 67 feet. And if you look at the markets for those two, they, they share the same clients, essentially, uh, with the same expectations uh, and the same drivers, political drivers um, for net zero from the products that they're manufacturing. So the expectations of the clients are the same. They want, um, they're prepared to pay more for more. They're certainly not prepared to pay more for less. So as we move towards net zero, 
the client experience has got to move with it. It has got to improve. You can't go backwards. But then uh, the, the, the economies, the economics of those two market sectors are very different, yet the expectations are the same. We can move on to the next one. Um, so automotive, the electric vehicle market, uh, they have very high volume production, huge compound growth rate, I mean, absolutely huge. It's running at around or has been running at about 50% per annum. Total number of vehicles on the road, something like 7 million. So you're talking big numbers here. And it's dominated by a few global players. And those global players can justify very big R&D budgets. Um, and there you're looking at billions, not millions, because they can see a return on that investment. The volume, product volumes are there uh, to get, to be pretty certain that they can get a return on investment in whatever it is, electric motors or, or battery technology or control systems. So if we go to the next slide and look at the maritime sector, and here I'm interested in smaller vessels. By smaller vessels, I mean, up to around 40 meters. So uh, beyond the 24 meter uh, recreational craft directive limit uh, in, into um, straying into our uh, international maritime organization, IMO vessels, but, essentially, but not cargo ships, which are optimized in a different fashion. And here the growth rates are much lower, 5% um, at best at the moment. The, number of products manufactured per production run are very much lower. You don't see hundreds of thousands of a particular vessel produced. You might see a few tens. Um, if you're lucky, a few hundreds if you're even luckier, but rarely beyond that. So there's no obvious return um, on, on your R&D investment from a, a specific vessel. Uh, and there are no automotive scale global players. There are players who have global outreach and Sunseeker are very much amongst that group, but there's, no, there's nobody of the scale of Tesla or Toyota or General Motors um, behind this. And therefore the, the ability to invest for the maritime sector to invest in its own right is very much more limited than the automotive sector, yet the drivers are, are the same. So, how are we going to achieve this? How are we going to get this, um, achieve this net zero maritime target? So if we can look at the next slide, please. And this, these, these are my own views based on experience and much of the work in Brussels. The, our industry is very risk averse um, because numbers are low, you can't afford to get the first vessel wrong. So we don't have the luxury of being able to uh, trial new technologies and the luxury of making mistakes. And that means that uh, some of the basic, there are some basic things we can do, like looking at electrical systems architecture, for example, the nonsense of having to turn a generator on if you want to switch on a light. That, that's relatively easily dealt with. And the use of stored energy allows us to move away from uh, standalone generators. So uh, using the main engine as a generator is, a, is, a, is uh, one of the options that we're looking at in some detail at the moment. Uh, that leads to overall improvements in fuel efficiency. We're seeing a significant increase now in the use of renewables, especially solar. And if you cast the mind back to the power cat, uh, those vessels like that have very large surface areas, therefore the ability to carry a lot of solar, which can be fits very nicely uh, with the, the greatest um, storage capabilities, energy storage capabilities that we now have. So looking at the boat as, a, um, uh, as an energy harvesting machine, if you like, rather than just a means of um, getting you from A to B. Um, and all of this takes us towards uh, a longer term focus on the transition from diesel to hybrid uh, and then on to all electric. And for the bigger vessels, I think all electric is still quite a long way away. If we move on to the next slide, 
we've been uh, in, in the last 12 months or so working with automotive technology to see what we can do. Um, and the, 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 one of the major areas where the automotive sector is investing literally billions into um, uh, large scale energy storage. And the photograph on the top left there is a BMW i3 battery pack. Um, they are now up to around 40 kilowatt hours per pack. They're waterproof, they're fully sealed, uh, plug and play type options for automotive, um, not plug and play for maritime, but the concepts are, are, are good. Charging systems are coming along very rapidly to enable uh, users to, to charge those, those um, larger scale energy storage systems. High efficiency motor generators, there's been a huge change. Um, in electric propulsion and electric generation. And top right is a, an axial flux um, motor generator from Yasa, a spin out from Oxford University, uh, which is a, a, just an amazing bit of kit. It's uh, about 300 mil um, uh, in diameter. It's about 100 mil thick, weighs 30 kilos. And if you can supply it with 800 volts, it will deliver you somewhat something like 200 kilowatts of propulsion power um, and uh, at uh, more reasonable voltages like 400 volts you you still get 100 kilowatts of, of um, either propulsion or, or generation they're fully reversible less obvious uh, uh, developments have been in motor controllers if you have a high power motor generator like that you need to be able to control it sevcon um, based in uh, Gates Head, um, are experts in, in that area, and the power equipment, power conversion equipment that goes with that, safety systems and so on. But next slide, if you would, these are not shoe-ins to the maritime sector. Uh, they, and then there's quite a lot of engineering goes into taking those really superb bits of technology uh, and adapting them for Automotive for, for, for our sector and for our use. If you go on to the next slide. And this is uh, a proof of concept. Of, it's an example of the kind of thing that you can do. And here we've uh, taken a, a standard um, maritime powertrain. Uh, so you've got a 480 horsepower Yanmar engine, standard maritime gearbox. We've split one from the other and dropped one of these Yasa 100 kilowatt. Uh, motor generators into the slot in between. Um, and that opens up all sorts of opportunities for the industry. From that, we're seeing overall vessel fuel consumption reduced by something like 25%. We've ditched the generators. Uh, we've got 160 kilowatt hours of storage on that for BMW i3 batteries. And the lithium ion batteries that we're using, the i3 batteries, are second life EV batteries. So we're playing very nicely into the um, recycling uh, chain there. So when they're no longer used in BMWs, we can use them in, in boats because the uh, duty cycle is different. And what do we need to deliver this long term? So the final slide, please. This is, again, my view. Uh, we need commitment from the industry to do this. We need collaboration throughout the industry. Uh, because th this is systems development, it's not necessarily, not necessarily specific technology development, and clearly, as ever, we need cash. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. I would be delighted to take questions. Ken, th thanks very much. I, what I think would be helpful, given where we are on time, uh, as I say, with all of these, we could spend the whole evening talking about each project and each presentation, because there's a huge amount in there. If you're able to have a go at answering some of these in the either the Q&A chat section or the panel section, that would be very helpful. I, yeah, I okay. do think That's great. this is very, very much the start of the discussion for some people and colleagues from Bristol City Council as, as well, keen to know uh, what what's going on in this space and, and how they reflect that within what they're doing. So I think it's very much the start of it for the engagement for a number of people. So we'll, we'll pick that up. Just one reflection, if I may, having said we're going to move on. Is that um, is that people will have colleagues will have seen that the the government announced twenty million pounds of funding um, to to demonstrate how these technologies can be used and what viable options there might be. I'm sure 
colleagues from this region will will bid into that properly. But there's there's, there's another reason why I think the maritime sector needs that public funding and the call to colleagues on the line who are from decision making positions is that the the maritime sector through COVID has has essentially burnt through a huge amount of cash keeping the country going and, and keeping people in work as is right. But it, it means that we're facing this greatest industrial transformation in an even more tricky position than we were beforehand when you are right to compare the automotive and maritime sector's ability to invest in R&D. So I think it's uh, there's no lack of appetite, there's a willingness, but just as the commercial markets have, have lessened their uh, their lending as well, and uh, we're watching with interest in terms of what's happening with green finance. But I think it's really, it's, it's a real point to make is that this is a sector that uh, it does have its hands behind its back when it comes to the ability to invest, and we will look to government to provide that confidence to, to catalyze um, private sector investment and involvement. But there are some things only government can do, and um, and providing some funding is part of that, but also that confidence that that, that the industry can then rally around to. So just a, just a, a note for our political colleagues on, on the call. But yes, thanks very much, Ken. Uh, just okay. moving on now, now, folks, we've got three tangible, real, in the works examples of where uh, the industry in the region is seeking significant funding from government uh, and with a co-investment um, picture too, to actually accelerate some of the opportunities around net zero for the region. And you, you'll have seen a, the Prime Minister standing up at the Tory party conference and then more recently talking about the ambition to power every home through offshore wind and including floating offshore wind by 2030. Clearly this region is at the forefront of being able to capitalise upon that. And we have colleagues to talk about a particular uh, bid that's being developed to, to capitalise on the opportunity around floating offshore wind in particular. So uh, who, who have we got here presenting? Is it Steve? It's Deborah. It's Deborah, sorry. Well, I'm going to start off and then I'm going to hand over to Steve. Fine, over to you, Deborah. Okay, thank you very much. So my name is Deborah Greaves. I'm Professor of Ocean Engineering at the University of Plymouth. And I'm also the head of school for the School of Engineering, Computing and Mathematics. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about this exciting new project that we have just put in a proposal for. This is the Southwest Flow Accelerator. Um, looking to develop floating offshore wind and the supply chain around that. And this is a, a proposal to the strength in places um, scheme. So first of all, just to say a little bit about um, the strength in places. So it's about the place. And it just so happens that the Celtic Sea is one of probably only two uh, areas where floating offshore wind is, is really a, a, a possibility around the UK. And also uh, in this place, we have built up a real track record of, of expertise and experience in marine and offshore renewable energy between the University of Plymouth and the University of Exeter. So at the University of Plymouth, we have our coast laboratory. Um, this hosts some uh, world-class laboratory uh, wave tank testing facilities, which have been used over the last 10 years to help um, developers of offshore renewable energy technologies um, to move their devices forward and, and optimise their device uh, technologies. Um, through the research that we've been doing over, over the last 10 years or so, then we've built up our track record. And for the last couple of years from the University of Plymouth, we've been leading um, the nine million pound EPSRC's offshore renewable energy hub. Uh, we're leading a consortium of 10 universities around the UK um, and we're bringing together uh, our research expertise we're providing leadership to help uh, accelerate the research um, and the development of the offshore renewable energy sector. And that includes offshore wind, uh, particularly targeting floating offshore wind, but it includes all of offshore wind and also wave energy and tidal stream energy as well. Um, so we are uh, we're leading that, that research and um, we've also secured uh, much research over the last number of years as well. Um, and we're, within the, the hub, we're bringing together uh, academics with industry and uh, policymakers. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? We work a lot uh, together with the University of Exeter in the region and Exeter um, have also built up a good, uh, strong track record in offshore renewable energy research. They have the uh, 
DMAC, which is the Dynamic Marine Component Test Facility, which has been used to test moorings and cables um, over the last few years in, in floating offshore wind and floating wave energy uh, technology solutions. Uh, we work together on the Marine Eye project, which is an ERDF project and various other projects we've worked together on. Um, and they also, from Exeter, they uh, look after the Falmouth Bay demonstration facility known as FabTest. So the universities in the region have been working together for a number of years in marine and offshore renewable energy. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So then we've uh, working together in this, this new bid, the Southwest Flow Accelerator. So this is a proposal led by WaveHub, uh, University of Exeter, University of Plymouth, uh, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, and also a &P Group based in Falmouth. Um, and this is the Strength in Places proposal. We, we've through to the second round and the second round proposal was submitted in November, towards the end of November. Um, we went through an expression of interest phase to start with and we're one of 17 uh, proposals that have gone through to the full proposal stage. Um, the total value of the project is 65 million um, and uh, it comprises a research, uh, development and innovation and a, a large amount of competition uh, funding that can be uh, bid for by uh, companies in the region. So what we're really trying to do is to support um, the development of offshore wind in the region and to support the development of the supply chain in order to enable that uh, floating offshore wind to be developed. We've heard a lot about uh, renewable uh, uh, um, transport and, and different uses of marine renewable energy or offshore renewable energy. Uh, this is the way that we're going to uh, be able to generate that. So as I mentioned, the, um, the Celtic Sea has been identified as a, an opportunity, a place where we can really develop our uh, next phase of offshore wind, which will need to be floating and floating offshore wind needs uh, deeper water. So the Celtic Sea is an, is an ideal uh, uh, location for that. So if we move on to the, the next slide, please. Um, so within this project, uh, we're supporting the development of the supply chain, we're support, supporting the development of uh, floating offshore wind. Um, we have a, a number of um, technology approaches and cost reduction um, plans within our, our research program. Part of that is around developing uh, autonomous systems and sensor systems uh, in order to survey the seabed and to help to, um, to, to optimize the consenting process, looking at, uh, looking at the environmental effects and uh, looking at how we can deconflict those. Then we also have a, a number of areas where we're looking at uh, technology cost reduction, looking at the floater, looking at the moorings, looking at the structure of the foundation and uh, trying to optimize that with the support from the facilities we have within the universities and the research expertise. Also on the marine operations side, looking at uh, new methods for uh, installation, maintenance and uh, inspection using autonomous systems and other um, technologies. And a lot of this is being underpinned by new advances in machine learning and, and AI developments as well for visualization of the data, interpretation of the data, uh, simulation of the, uh, of the interactions using digital twin type technology. So these, uh, these research facilities and expertise will, will underpin the, the work that's um, done within the project. And there's a large amount of competition funding which will become available um, for local businesses to work with the universities and uh, to benefit from their experience and their facilities. And uh, so what we want to see is we want to see this really uh, leverage and unlock the opportunity for the Southwest um, to grow our supply chain to support the development of this exciting uh, new industry. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Steve Jeremy now. Um, Deborah, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Steve Jeremy, I'm the Chief Executive at um, uh, WaveHub Limited, I'm also sitting on the Local Enterprise Partnership, uh, where I'm responsible for marine and energy matters. And last but not least, I sit on the offshore wind industry council, uh, where I'm uh, representative for the Celtic Sea. 
Um, just to show you how well integrated the offshore renewable businesses are, um, Deborah actually sits on my board as well as a non-executive director. So it shows there's a very close relationship between both the business and the uh, renewable sector. Floating offshore winds, exciting. In fact, it's probably the most exciting thing I've seen in over a decade of working in this sector. There are only, only two locations you can do this, Scotland and, and the Southwest. And, and it's a multi-billion pound opportunity. Multi-billion pound opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Why are we excited about it? Five reasons that makes floating wind different from conventional offshore wind. Firstly, we can mass produce the floaters, um, unlike uh, conventional jackets and monopiles, which have to be fine-tuned for their geotechnics. So that means we can production engineer them. We can do the construction in sheltered waters, which saves huge amounts in terms of vessels offshore. The big jack-up offshore is probably in the region of 350 to 500,000 pounds a day. We can take the biggest turbines, uh, we can access the best wind resources, which are generally to the west and to the northwest of the UK. Uh, and last but not least, we can scale rapidly. Um, what that gives us is the capacity effects you see below. Um, normally for a conventional offshore wind project, you'd look at a capacity factor of about 40%. Uh, the high wind project, which is the Scottish one, first of the arrays, is actually up at 58%. So it gives you an indication of what this technology could do. Next slide, please. Um, here's the first project likely to be in the Celtic Sea. This is the one that we're working on at the moment. I'm in the process of selling the offshore site to a project or a technology developer. Uh, and we've got interest in the site. In fact, a lot of interest in the site. Uh, and we're at the moment, we're probably two thirds of the way through that sale process with a view to getting the site sold and then working with the developer to start building a uh, floating wind in the Celtic Sea from uh, January, 21 onwards. Uh, we'd hope to have first power if this is all successful uh, as soon as 2023. And that would be the first of uh, a number of pipeline projects, demonstrator projects. To give you a sense of it, a 500 megawatt wind farm is probably two to three billion pounds worth of investment uh, and would require 50 of those floaters. We'd probably deploy four at a uh, wave farm. But to give you a sense of that scale, uh, those floaters reach about 10,000 tonnes, so give you um, a sense of the scale of what the industrialisation comprises. In the Celtic Sea, the initial work we've done suggested there is somewhere north of 100 gigawatts worth of installation potential uh, against a UK maximum requirement in terms of power of 45 gigawatts. Next slide, please. Um, what's next? Uh, well, what's next is that we need to do three things, really, and this is where um, we're integrated with the Strength in Places um, bid, uh, which, which is very much focused on um, delivering what it is that we need to do. Uh, we need three things to create a proper pipeline. We need, firstly, a market. Secondly, we need to front load investment in the supply chain. And third, we need to make sure all the support that's working in support of that supply chain is working in an integrated way. For the flow pipeline, uh, what we're looking at is at the moment, the government is talking about one gigawatt by 2030, which is terrific to hear, but we need more. Uh, I think we need three gigawatts in the Celtic Sea by 2030, and we need three gigawatts in Scottish waters. And if we can get that pipeline, then there's no doubt in my mind that we can establish world leading uh, positions for both of those two regions. Uh, we need revenue support on a decreasing scale, and indeed that's in prospect in the contracts for different mechanism. Uh, we need to work, work out how our supply chain plans are integrated so that we maximize local content. And I think we also need to move at speed uh, and quicker than we do at the moment. At the moment, it takes eight years to get one of these projects into the water. We think that with the work that we're planning to do in the Southwest Floating Offshore and Explorator that uh, Deborah's talked through that we can probably do to reduce that to four. Secondly, we need to actually front load investment in the supply chain so that actually the work is, as the work comes on stream in the projects, we have a supply chain that can pick up that work and maximize local content. Uh, and last, but by no means least, I think we actually need integrated regional support so that all elements of support, um, supply, uh, the university sectors, business assist, skills, and so on, are working in support of this terrific opportunity. Next slide, please. Um, I think it's for, next slide, please. And I'll go on anyway, in the absence of that slide, let me just summarise by saying this is an extraordinary opportunity. I've never seen anything like it in my time in this. Winter. Um, to colleagues who are old enough like me, it feels a bit like the North Sea must have done in the 1960s as they were starting to build out. And indeed, what's interesting is that the multinational oil companies are piling in because they think that this is the way to go. 
Um, the flow southwest uh, floating offshore wind accelerator, if we get it, will be a terrific opportunity for us to position the great southwest to do this. Uh, and even if we don't get it, we're very well positioned so to do. Uh, but delighted to take questions on this. Uh, this is maybe an offshore wind industry, an offshore wind sector led um, sector, but the supply chain is the maritime supply chain. So it's very much an integrated approach between the two sectors. Luca, I think Brilliant. that's probably enough for me. Thanks very much, Steve. I think what we'll do is we'll we'll go through all of these three projects and then we'll we'll open up to questions. But I think what's uh, what's really important there to, to people is there's a huge amount of talk in the in the press and nationally about offshore wind and floating wind. What we've given here is a specific tangible example of how people on the call can help realize that and and see the value for for the region in particular so thanks very much for bringing that to our attention and what we'll do is we'll make sure everybody who's been a participant to this has has details and a copy of that moving on to, to the second uh we've got uh futures future oceans institute and we've got alistair from talis uh, over to you Hi Ben, yeah, thank you very much everybody. Um, as has been said, I'm Alastair from Ambrosiac and Tallards. Um, and we're one of the key industrial partners for the Future Oceans Institute. Uh, and we're hugely excited by this initiative um, with over a thousand people across the South West region, mostly working um, in the uh, defence maritime sector, but not, not exclusively. Um, uh, we as a, a global technology company want to see to accelerate the success of the maritime sector across all areas of the southwest uh, and we see this joint uh, cross-government industry academia and and local regional initiative will be crucial um, for the future economic prosperity uh, in the region uh, now as many of you have, have heard throughout throughout the day um, you know, there is a massive opportunity economically um, uh, in, in the, the blue economy with um, growth from uh, 1.9 trillion to 2.3 trillion pounds worth of, uh, of economic value and, and this this really means a huge opportunity for the southwest and with it with it being the largest maritime cluster in the UK um, it, it's got some some hugely important leadership um, positions in a number of areas, um, you know, amongst um, autonomous systems, marine and science research, geospatial, uh, marine manufacturing, um, uh, to name to name just a few. And you, you've kind of seen some of the examples of some of the projects already running at the moment. Um, and to place this in a kind of wider strategic context, um, you probably have seen the Maritime 2050 strategy and um, we have been part of trying to push for a, a, an innovation hub bid as part of that for um, for Plymouth and the south and the southwest uh, around um, maritime autonomy and um, and digital maritime systems. Um, we've also got a DIT high potential opportunity on maritime autonomy in the southwest. Um, now this is particularly trying to look at how to generate and focus inward investment into the region um, and uh, utilize um, Department for um, International Trade's global network to try and drive this. Um, we've seen international uh, recognition start to build around around the region um, and amongst other areas you know we've seen focus in, in, in recent weeks on the Ministry of Defence is innovation, shipbuilding and, and, and general investment in the maritime domain. Um, alongside positive news that we've seen from the floating offshore wind program, you know, there's a huge amount of momentum in, in the region. Um, but, but really, how are we going to capitalise on this and how are we going to accelerate um, the growth in, in what is a really um, you know, opportune strategic um, environment, particularly around the sustainability piece? So next slide, please. So, so the Future Oceans Institute is a um, it, it brings together the, the key um, economic um, partners and drivers from both the private uh, and the public sector. Um, and, and this is a this is this Future Oceans Initiative has been worked with Maritime UK Southwest, uh, Great Southwest partners um, uh, across Dorset, Somerset, Devon, and Cornwall. Um, 
and it's been worked on over the last 10 months and started pre-COVID, but actually is uh, has a potential to provide a real platform to build on in the post-COVID recovery. Um, it, it builds on you know, over 400 years of, of heritage in, in, this, in this sector um, and will help shape the region's offer to the UK, as you've seen from areas such as the Northern Powerhouse and Midlands Engine, with a clear focus on placing the UK as a world leader in advanced maritime technology, innovation and sustainability. And it will bring together this triple helix model of innovation with academia, industry, catapults and government departments to really focus in on, on the future ocean economy. Um, and our aim is to create a nationally and globally recognised hub to support the UK as a science and technology superpower and really aligned to some of the government's broad um, strategic narrative around levelling up. Um, as part of our initial CSR bid this autumn, um, with the support of, over, of nine similar research and industrial hubs around the world, alongside the region's globally recognised Met Office and UK Hydrographic Office, along with some central government colleagues, uh, who are all significant partners in, in fully realising the future opportunities from, from the, the ocean economy. It, this will provide a groundbreaking framework for the Southwest with a roadmap for accelerate the growth of the maritime sector as one of the region's most significant sectors. Uh, we've identified key areas of focus, as you can see on the slide, but really seeing marine autonomy and as a critical technology driver and renewable energy as a, as a really important sector that's, that's fast approaching. Um, and this is vital part of the region's contribution to the UK's digitally focused and tech led recovery and is vital part of post COVID recovery plan to build back better with a focus on sustainability and an aim to create over 4000 jobs in the long term with some immediate focus around capital construction and then high value engineering design R&D and manufacturing jobs for the next five years and beyond. So following the changes, as, as you will have seen to the comprehensive spending review process, we're now looking to work with uh, governments via um, Department of Business and the uh, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government to co-design this significant multi-million pound program that boosts and raises the profile of the work already underway in the Southwest. And we'll hopefully kick off a series of, of workshops in the new year. Um, the marine and maritime sector has the potential to enable cross-government and regional collaboration to develop and attract high-value jobs, increase productivity and economic activity in, in, in the region, and the ability to leverage research and development to develop clusters that will be vital support the levelling up agenda um, and contribute to the UK's economic recovery. Now, this is a huge opportunity for the region and we welcome support from this engaged audience to help drive forward, forward and really put the southwest on the map both nationally and internationally around uh, advanced maritime technology innovation and sustainability and that's uh, everything thanks ben that's great thanks uh, i saw a little round of applause there from tudor as well so it's, uh, it's gone down well <laughs> gone down well in his kitchen. So uh, no, thanks very much for that, uh, Alistair. Um, I think what we'll we'll do is we'll move on to the to the final uh, presentation. Clearly, what we'll we'll do after this is send much more detail to everybody. But I want to make sure we get the bulk of this done within time. Um, and I'd just like to invite Martin to to present now. And I think what's interesting here is people can really see the breadth of what we mean by maritime. We're talking about how. Uh, We've spoken about how we move vessels. We're now talking, talking about ocean science and ocean technology. And now we're talking about how uh, aquaculture, which sits within our understanding of the sector, can help uh, the economy decarbonize more broadly too. So over to you, Martin. Thank you, Ben. Uh, if we could have the first slide, please. Thank you. So uh, as Ben said, I'm Martin Sutcliffe. I'm the Aquaculture and Fisheries Development Officer for Dorset Coast Forum, which is hosted by Dorset Council. But then one of my other hats is I also chair the Southwest Aquaculture Network, which um, Alistair referred to a, a three, a triple helix earlier. And that third part of the helix was the aquaculture. Uh, so I've been asked to talk today about an aquaculture innovation centre and also around aquaculture parks. We'll start off with the aquaculture innovation centre and just really define what it is. Um, 
most new entrants to the sector tend to be SMEs uh, and inherently aquaculture is capital intensive like most sectors in, in the maritime world. Um, but often with aquaculture, there's many years before you get a return on investment. Um, if you take scallops as an example, it can be up to three years before the animals are ready for, for market. So an aquaculture innovation space or innovation center is a physical space which leads on R&D in aquaculture, but at the same time reduces commercial risk for new entrants. It provides an incubation hub, if you like, uh, to help develop skills, provide training specific to husbandry tasks, offshore working, and uh, offer technical support. There is an aquaculture innovation center in Scotland, and rightly, in, this, in my opinion, this focuses on the Scottish sector. Um, it's very likely that as the English sector develops further, it'll develop in a very different way to Scotland's salmon-focused sector. There's a number of reasons for this, but not least is the different geo uh, geographic kind of coastline of England when you compare that with the Scottish coasts. Um, there are a number of government-funded agriculture-focused technology, technology centres, for example, CHAC, AgriEpi and AgriMetrics, but these ten, traditionally have tended to focus on agriculture, although they are now starting to take an interest in aquaculture. Next slide, please. So why now? Um, well, with an increasing global population and related increased demand for sustainable protein, wild fisheries plateauing at best and less and less space on land for agricultural development, again, that's linked to population growth, there has to be a, uh, a sustainable opportunity or alternative to provide um, protein and aquaculture fixed with that. Um, there remains a commercial risk though, as I outlined earlier. Um, the fin fish sector, so salmon and trout, for example, does what it does very well. Um, and the English sector will likely need to develop new cultivation techniques, novel species and new technologies for aquaculture. And an aquaculture incent, uh, innovation center could provide the business incubation environment enabling all of these things. And why now? Um, well, Seafood 2040, which is a DEFRA supported and ministerial supported proje uh, project, which has been running for the past few years, has just recently released the English Aquaculture National Strategy. And this is a very um, ambitious target to grow production in England tenfold over the next 20 years. Um, this, the English strategy also highlights an innovation centre as a critical point to develop the sector. Uh, and then additionally, the work that I've been doing locally in Dorset and across the wider Southwest, um, we've done extensive stakeholder engagement in Dorset and uh, over the last four years, and we've uh, an innovation centre is also highlighted in the Dorset Mariculture Strategy was released earlier this year. So in short, the sector wants it. The New English Strategy has identified it as a critical action, and it's in the Dorset Strategy as too. So uh, momentum is clearly behind the idea, and it's a case of striking while the iron is hot. There's also also significant political will locally within Dorset and across the wider Southwest. Um, it's highlighted within the Dorset local industrial strategy. Uh, and there's a political opportunity, I think, with Brexit uh, to open up new trade routes and new, new products alongside introducing shorter supply chains and reducing carbon emissions and, and build resilience uh, post-COVID. Next slide, please. I'll come on to the cost at the end of the at the end of the presentation. Uh, just some rough outline costs. Um, aquaculture parks. Uh, this is this is an interesting concept. Um, most of the audience will probably be aware that when you want to try and put something into the sea, there's a multitude of agencies, organisations, and other stakeholders that have an interest or want to say how, where, and when that happens. Not least, you've got the statutory agencies of the Marine Management Organisation, Natural England, local council landowners, the inshore fisheries conservation authorities, and the list goes on and on. Um, and although the uh, Coastal Condornat, Concordat is starting to coordinate agencies um, work towards licensing permissions, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, the Coastal Concordat tends, is led by the MMO, and this can prove costly for, um, for new entrants, particularly into, into the sector. Um, so an aquaculture park allows for the development of new entrants into the sector by reducing the startup costs, um, reducing commercial risks, and allowing for development of new and novel ideas and, and new species. And this is all done because in, in one way, all of the relevant licensing and permission work is actually carried out by one controlling body um, and simplifying the processing, the process for application license um, applications and reducing costs for new entrants to the sector. And how does this work in practice? If we could just move on to the next slide, please. 
We have an area in Poole Harbour, um, which is controlled by the Southern Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority. Uh, this is an area that is um, in effect taken out of the public ownership and controlled by the IFCA, uh, and they sublease areas of Poole Harbour to seabed to shellfish growers. The growers must agree to terms and conditions of the lease, um, but most importantly, this removes the onus on the aquaculture business to obtain all the licenses and permissions that are needed to carry out that activity in Poole Harbour. It streamlines the process and it provides the applicant with only one agency to deal with, in this case, the IFCA. Um, so all relevant work and the controlling work is carried out by the IFCA. Uh, and it's important to note that, that this, this sort of work can be uh, coexisting either close to or, net or uh, within MPAs. Uh, and Plymouth University, Dr. Emma Sheehan has been doing some great work alongside uh, the offshore shellfish in Lyme Bay as how, how aquaculture installations can uh, coexist with MPAs and ha can have actually beneficial um, impacts on the wild, wild capture fisheries. Uh, if we think about it as well, the, these two uh, con concept ideas are almost intrinsically linked. If an innovation park and innovation center with licensing can be developed concurrently, then, then they would provide mutually benefit benefits to each element of, of each of the concept. And if we just move to the uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the main costs at the moment, um, the aquaculture parks are basically a low capital investment as it just requires licensing and permissions. And there is some cost involved in that, but it's not a huge amount of money at all. Uh, the main cost when it comes to aquaculture park is time and administrative burden, which is what puts off a lot of SMEs and a lot of new entrants into the, into the, into the uh, sector. And then finally, with an aquaculture innovation center, I guess we've got one or two options here. We can either go for a new build, which is uh, anywhere between 50 and 100 million pounds of investment or repurpose an existing, billion, an existing building, um, which could be anywhere between three to five million pounds investment. Uh, Dorset Coast Forum and uh, Dorset Council are planning to undertake uh, economic study and some stakeholder engagement to in early 2021 to actually fine tune the cost for this, uh, come up with a business model and come up with uh, some sort of long-term funding model for, for the centre. Uh, if we could just move to the final slide then, thank you. So how does this all fit with net zero? Um, I think it fits really well, um, particularly with regards to clean maritime futures. It creates um, highly skilled, well-played employment um, and provides food security and reduces food miles. Uh, and it also relieves pressure on wild capture fisheries. As I said, um, it's likely that the English sector is not going to develop in a similar way to the Scottish sector, but it could help relieve pr um, pressures on shell fisheries, for example. And then the seaweed farms can actually act as, act as carbon sinks. Um, seaweed captures a lot of carbon as it grows, um, and then this can be utilized um, to, to remove carbon from the ocean itself. And finally, I think, which is an important point, it, an aquaculture innovation center and aquaculture development can revive coastal communities. Uh, there's a, a great example just north of the border in Scotland where a lot of coastal communities in the highlands and islands uh, could well be um, pretty much ghost towns now if it wasn't for the salmon sector that, that has developed in that area. And that's it for me, from me, thank you. Brilliant, well, thank you very much uh, for that. <laughs> We've seen a huge breadth of projects and initiatives here that are all pulling in the same direction. And, and actually it just shows the the breadth of offer and capability that the region has in pursuit of this, this agenda. So I think really interesting. Clearly, um, I've not done the best job of chairing, um, but I think that's, if I'm to uh, spin this, it's because there's so much happening in the Southwest that it's not been possible to fit it into two hours. But the, the important thing here is that we've got a really good network of people across different tiers of government here who all support the agenda. And I think what we will do um, after this is certainly for these three projects here is get a, a more detailed briefing from each of the projects and send them to uh, the people who registered for here. We'll also send them to the others who, who tried to come and couldn't come because of parliamentary pressures or whatever. But from a Maritime UK perspective, we'll, we'll be taking and working with those projects, particularly those, those last three, to support them in every way that we can because it's really important that we actually, when we have companies coming together and putting propositions together and collaborating, that we do support them in the best way that we can. Um, clearly ways that we can improve this for other regions, but I think it's really important that, we, uh, that we've done this and we've shown the breadth of activity. A couple of quick takeaways that, we, that we'll be that we're doing already. We are developing a national projects database to share with 
funding bodies and with government departments, which all those announced today will be on. Uh, we'll also be doing similar briefings to this uh, across Parliament, uh, across local authorities and within industry. And, and all the projects here today give us a, a foundation to build upon. And I think just a call, we're all mindful of a CSR bid that will be coming up or CSR process, sorry, that will start in July, probably. We just need to make sure we're all working together on that and to strengthen the collective, or sorry, the individual uh, pushes that we'll be making uh, in this direction. Uh, I'm conscious we, we, we are over time now, so I just want to see whether anybody's got any further reflections, uh, particularly on how we might be able to work together on this agenda. Luke, I know you've got to go, but if you've got any, any reflections very briefly. Yeah, thank you, Ben. I think this has been an excellent, uh, an excellent set of presentations that's shown the real depth of uh, of what we've got to offer as a region. I think the challenge for us as a region is to make sure that we are speaking with one voice, that we're promoting these schemes. And as we've seen from so many of them, there is interlocking, uh, in, interconnected, interdependent uh, expertise, discovery and funding streams. So what we do need to make sure is that we're not doing what sometimes the Southwest is very good at, and that is hiding our light under a bushel and then hiding the bushel. We need to be loud and proud about this stuff because actually we've got enormous potential to create jobs in the future, to decarbonize uh, uh, our maritime sector and to really create a exciting and innovative future for our region. So please don't hide your light under a bushel, be vocal about these projects. There's so much here that I think the region needs to know about because once they know about it, we can really uh, promote the pride uh, in what we've got. I think there is uh, ambition from parliamentarians uh, to speak up this area. What we now need to make sure is that there's energy and activity behind it. And I know Maritime UK will be uh, speaking to colleagues on a cross-party basis to really motor this. But also we need to make sure it's joined up at a local level with local councils, local councillors, uh, members of parliament, businesses, LEPs, and so many other bits to side, all pointing in the right direction. Because if we do that, then we have the potential, I think, to achieve something really quite special, not just for our region, but to contribute to net zero by, well, I'm a 2030 kind of person, but by any date you want, uh, and net zero by 2050 is the illegal target that the government has set. But with innovation proceeding at pace, we need to bring it forwards if we are to prevent irreversible uh, climate change. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you for the energy. And I think I'm, I'm personally, I'm really uh, thrilled and excited about what are the, uh, the range of projects that we've got going on around our region. So thank you very much for all your work. Brilliant. Well, no, thank you very much. I echo all those points and huge thanks to you for, for co-chairing today as well. Uh, we'll be in touch with the those that gave presentations to pull together a briefing and then working on a, on a more bilateral basis to make sure, as Luke says, we get these projects front and centre with those that need to know about them. So thanks very much to everybody who's joined us. We'll be extracting all the comments here and producing a briefing with some questions and answers. And the important thing is it's a dialogue that we're, we're all going to need to maintain to ensure that we, we get to this really ambitious but critical uh, destination. So thanks very much, everyone, and enjoy your evenings.